What's up, all stars? Welcome to the School of Ireland. Today, we're gonna to go over the 10 terms that show up the most consistently on the AP Psych FRQ that aren't from the Research Design Unit. And there'll be another video that covers those terms, but today we're gonna to focus on the most popular concepts from all the other units. But before we dive into this list, I need you to smash that like button and hit subscribe so that you'll be alerted when new awesome psych videos are uploaded. Let's get started. To kick us off at number 10, we have the Yerkes, Dots, and Law. Now, to be honest, there are about 30 terms that actually tied for this 10th place spot. But the reason I chose the Yerkes Dotson Law is because it's shown up a lot in recent years. Now, what you need to know is that the Yerkes Dotson Law examines the relationship between arousal and performance. Now, when I say arousal, what I'm talking about is a state of alertness or excitement that drives a person to learn or perform a task. Physiologically, what happens is your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and your heart starts to beat faster, your palms get sweatier, and your digestion begins to slow down in order to conserve energy. But the most important takeaway for you is that the Yerkes Dotson Law states that we perform perform our best at a moderate level of arousal. So what we're looking at here is a continuum that plots out what our performance would look like in overstimulating and understimulating situations. So for example, if you're over here in a highly aroused state, this will lead to a state of panic and therefore a low level of performance. Even at this point, you would have a lot of anxiety and your performance wouldn't be that great. If you were to keep going a bit further up the chart, your performance would get better. However, even here, you would still be experiencing stress because your level of arousal is still high. Over on the left side, you'll see that as your level of arousal decreases, so does your performance. At this stage, you're mildly aware, but you're not super focused on what you're doing. Here, you would be experiencing boredom, and near the bottom, you would be asleep. So as you can see, a moderate level of arousal leads to maximum performance. Let me give you an example. Say you're about to take a big test, or you're coach wants you to take the game winning shot. You obviously don't want to have a high level of arousal because this will cripple your performance. But you also don't want your level of arousal to be too low because you may not be focused enough to do well on the task at hand. So again, a moderate level of arousal will lead to maximum performance. Coming in at the number nine spot, we have operant conditioning. Operant conditioning focuses on how rewards and punishments shape behavior. It has a bunch of terms associated with it, including positive and negative reinforcement and positive and negative punishment. Let's pause right here. A lot of people get these terms mixed up. Positive doesn't mean good and negative doesn't mean bad. Positive means the addition of something and negative means the removal of something. So if you hear the term positive reinforcement, it means that rewards are given in order to encourage a behavior to occur again. For example, if a kid does his chores, he gets a cookie. The behavior that the parents want to occur again is doing the chores, and the reward is the addition of a cookie. On the other hand, negative reinforcement is the removal of an aversive stimulus. For example, if you start driving without your seatbelt and your car starts making this sound, when you buckle the seatbelt, you're removing the aversive stimulus. Positive punishment can be defined as the addition of something unpleasant in order to get a behavior to stop. So for example, when a child says a bad word, their parents may wash out their mouth with soap. The addition of the soap is the punishment and the bad language is the behavior that the parents want to stop. Negative punishment is the removal of a pleasant stimulus in order to stop a behavior. For example, when a student uses their phone in class, the teacher will take it away. The behavior that the teacher wants to stop is using the phone in class, and the removal of the phone from the student is the negative punishment. Now, this is a really brief overview of operant conditioning. Again, it can be defined as the use of rewards and punishments in order to shape behavior. Coming in at number eight on our list is fluid and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence can be defined as the ability to solve new problems and reason abstractly. This type of intelligence decreases with age. For example, have you ever tried to teach an older person how to use a new piece of technology like an iPhone or an iPad? It can be really difficult. Now, this is not a shot at older people. Look, I'm 30 years old and I'm already balding. But fluid intelligence explains this. As we get older, our ability to solve new problems fades away over time, so it makes sense that it's harder to teach an older person how to use a new piece of technology. Another example of fluid intelligence is a lawyer who's able to think quickly on their feet after the opposition presents an argument that they've never heard before. On the other hand, crystallized intelligence is the accumulation of facts, knowledge, and skills over a lifetime. This type of intelligence increases with age. So when I get older, my crystallized intelligence will consist of nerdy Star Wars facts and history knowledge that I've 
I've accumulated over my lifetime. At number seven on our list, we have de-individuation. Do you ever wonder why people do some really wacky things when their team wins the big game, like the Super Bowl or the Stanley Cup? At the celebration ceremony, you'll see people climbing telephone poles or throwing trash into the street. Well, this can be attributed to a process called de-individuation. This is where a group setting causes one to lose their self-awareness, and as a result, they abandon their normal self-restraints. The thought process that goes along with this, whether conscious or unconscious, is, hey, look, everyone else is doing this wacky stuff. There's no way I'm going to get in trouble. Look at everybody out here. They're not going to catch me. So as a result of this, the individual feels anonymous because of the group setting, and then they end up doing something that they wouldn't normally do as a consequence. So the next time you see someone climb up a light post after their team wins a big game, or you see someone smash in a store window, it's quite possible that de-individuation played a role in their behavior. Coming in at number six, we have self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a person's belief in their own ability to complete a task or solve a problem. For example, someone would have a high self-efficacy if they thought they were going to do well on a test they had the next day. Conversely, they would have a low self-efficacy if they didn't think they were going to do well on that same test. In general, it's better to have a high self-efficacy and to have confidence in your own ability instead of having a low self-efficacy and not having that confidence. Coming in at number five, we have heuristics. Heuristics can be defined as a rule of thumb strategy used to make quick decisions. For example, if you saw these two dogs, which one would you rather pet? I'm guessing that most people would say the dog on the right. And right there, you just used heuristics to make a quick judgment call. What's important to understand is that there are two types of heuristics, and we'll go over each respectively. But for now, what I want to do is ask you some questions. And when you answer these questions, I want you to go with the first thing that pops in your head. Don't think about them too hard. Just give your answer. Here we go. What percentage of crimes involve violence? Do more words in the English language start with the letter K or have K as their third letter? All right, last one. Do more people die from accidents or disease? If you have your answers, go ahead and put them in the comments below. Did you say more or less than 50% of crimes involve violence? The percentage of crimes that involve violence in the United States is actually less than 50%. In fact, it's way less. Only about 13% of crimes involve violence. What did you say for number two? Do more words in the English language start with the letter K or have K as the third letter? If you said more words have K as the third letter, you are correct. However, a lot of people say that more words begin with K because it's a lot easier to come up with words that begin with K rather than words that have K as the third letter. And what did you say for number three? Do more people die from accidents or disease? If you said accidents, you're actually wrong. Disease is the correct answer. But why? Well, when we watch the news or we look at social media, we're more likely to see that someone died from an accident than disease because that's what brings in the viewers. Unless, of course, it's 2020 and all everybody talks about is corona. Now, what's important to understand is that when you answer those questions, you use something called availability heuristics, which are a rule of thumb strategy used to make quick decisions based off information that comes to mind easily. Now, why does it come to mind easily? Maybe it's because you were talking about it with your friend the other day, or maybe you were daydreaming or thinking about it, or maybe Maybe you just saw it on social media or in the news. Now, what you don't want to do is confuse availability heuristics with representative heuristics, which are a rule of thumb strategy used to make quick decisions based off your proto or stereotype of a group. Now, let me give you an example. Is someone who loves math more likely to be a high school student or a college mathematics professor? I'm guessing that most of you chose college math professor, but statistically speaking, that's wrong. Let me show you why. There are approximately 24,000 public high schools in the United States. Now, let's assume that there are 15 math math teachers at each of these high schools because that's how many math teachers there are at the school I teach at. Each of these teachers teaches five classes. So we're going to make the assumption that all other math teachers also teach five classes. Now let's make one more assumption. We're going to assume that at least one student in each of these classes loves math. So if you multiply this out, you'll see that there are 1,800,000 high school students who love math. Now let's see if we can estimate the number of mathematics professors who love math. The first thing you need to know is that there are about 5,000 colleges in the United States. And we're going to go ahead and make the assumption that there are about 10 math professors at each of these schools. We'll also assume that every one of these professors loves math. So if you go ahead and multiply this out, you'll see that there are 50,000 mathematics professors who love math, a number far lower than 1,800,000. So if you got this question, wrong is probably because your proto or stereotype of someone who loves math is a college math professor. But based off pure probability, the number of high school students who love math will always outweigh the number of math professors. So if you're not seeing the pattern here, heuristics can be very useful for making quick decisions, just like when you were deciding which dog you should pet. However, they're often prone to errors, which is something that you want to note in your free response question. Coming in at number four, we have intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. 
Now, it's really important to understand the distinction between these two terms. A person is intrinsically motivated if the desire to perform a task comes from within the individual. This is a person who loves doing something just because they love doing that thing. For example, a person who does well in school because they love learning and because they wanna master the content is intrinsically motivated. On the other hand, a person who goes to school to get good grades or to get into a good college is extrinsically motivated. They are motivated by something that's outside of themselves. Another good example would be an NBA player. An NBA player who plays basketball because they love basketball is intrinsically motivated. On the other hand, an NBA player who plays for the millions of dollars that they receive is extrinsically motivated. So remember, someone who is intrinsically motivated is motivated by internal forces, and someone who is extrinsically motivated is motivated by factors outside of themselves. Coming in at the number three spot, we have the term conformity. Conformity is where a group standards cause a person to change either their beliefs or behavior in order to line up with that of the groups. This term stems from Solomon Ash's famous line experiment. So what Ash did in this experiment is he sent an individual into a room filled with other participants. But here's the thing, the participants who were already in the room were in on it. They were Confederates working for Ash. This meant that the only person who had no idea what was going on was the individual walking into the room. So the next thing that Ash would do was show everybody a series of slides that looked similar to this. The lab assistant would then ask questions like, which line on the right matches the line on the left? Now, the answer to this is pretty obvious. But at some point during the experiment, the Confederates would intentionally give a wrong answer. They would say something like, line 3 matches line X, which is obviously wrong. So after all the Confederates gave their answer, it came time for the one real participant to give their answer. So they then had to decide, should they go along with what the group was saying, or should they stick to their gut? So what's crazy is about 33% of the time, the real participant would conform and go along along with what the rest of the group said. But why would they do this? Well, the answer to that is twofold. The first explanation is something called normative social influence. This is where someone conforms because they want to fit in with a group. They don't want to be seen as an outsider or an outcast, so they're willing to go along with what the group has to say. Even though they may not agree necessarily with the answer that the group gave, they don't want to stand out. The second explanation is called informational social influence. This is where someone conforms because they believe that the group has more information or more knowledge than they themselves have. So they're willing to go along with the group because they truly believe that the group is right. Now, if you want to see some hilarious examples of conformity, you should check out the links I put in the description below. Coming in at number two, we have proactive and retroactive interference. Now, if you'll recall, no pun intended, these terms deal with our inability to retrieve information from our long-term memory. As a quick refresher, your working memory encodes information into your long-term memory. And when you want to recall those memories, that information is retrieved from your long-term memory and brought back into your working memory where information information is processed in the present. Now it's true that proactive and retroactive interference get confused a lot. However, there's a really helpful acronym to help you remember these terms, and that is porn. Now let me pause here. In no way, shape, or form am I endorsing porn. That's not what I'm doing. But if you remember back to the memory unit, the more wacky or strange the mnemonic memory device you're using, the more likely you are to remember that piece of information. So the further out there that memory device is, the more likely it's going to stay in your head. So let's define what this acronym means. The P stands for proactive interference. This is where old information interferes with your ability to recall new information. So for example, let's say you just started dating someone new and you accidentally call them by your old girlfriend or boyfriend's name. Uh-oh. This is proactive interference in action where old information interfered with your ability to recall new information. The R in porn stands for retroactive interference. And this is where new information interferes with your ability to recall old information. So for example, let's say you get a new boss at work and his name is Nick and your old boss's name was Oliver. So one day you're out and about and you happen to bump into your old boss, Oliver, and you walk up to him and say, hey, Nick, how's it going? You just call your old boss by your new boss's name. And that's what retroactive interference is. It's where new information interferes with the recall of old information. So when you see these terms on the test, I recommend writing the acronym out on your paper so that you don't get these terms confused. All right, guys, here we go. The term that shows up the most often on the AP Psych FRQ, except for those terms dealing with research design, is observational learning, aka social learning theory, aka modeling. For our purposes, these are all interchangeable. Observational learning is where an individual learns how to behave or act 
by observing others. The person who did a lot of research on observational learning was a guy by the name of Albert Bandora. What he did is he put kids in a room with a giant clown doll or a bobo doll where when you knocked it down, it would pop straight back up. From there, he instructed an adult to either play nicely with the doll or to abuse the doll, to hit it, to kick it, to throw it across the room. And what Bandora wanted to observe is how the kids reacted when the adult left the room. So what do you think happened? Well, big surprise, when the adult played nicely with the doll, the kids also played nicely with the doll. When the adult abused and hit and threw the doll across the room, the kids also acted aggressively towards the doll. This is observational learning in action. So as you can guess, observational learning takes place a ton when we're little, when we're trying to figure out the world. So let me give you another example. The other day, my son kept pointing to his head and I could not figure out for the life of me what he wanted. It wasn't until my wife came up to me and said, hey, he wants to wear a hood like his dad. So what I did is I ran upstairs, I grabbed a hoodie, brought it back downstairs and put it on him and he was the happiest little kid in the world. He just wanted to model my behavior. Now, if you want to see more hilarious examples of observational learning, I'll put some links in the description below. So that's it, All Stars. Those are the 10 terms that show up the most often on the AP Psych free response question that aren't from the research design unit. You should take some extra time to really learn these terms. Now, just because they show up a lot, it doesn't mean they'll show up on the test at all this year. So whatever you do, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I wish you the best of luck on the AP exam. I'll see you around. Don't forget to like and subscribe.